How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific 3 Eastern, is Sunday, 3 Pacific 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with the Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian. And it is Thursday here on the show. You know what that means? We've got a lot to talk about, a lot of stuff coming up this weekend. we got SmackDown, Return of Logan Paul, Bailey choosing her mania opponent, which I'm sure will be a big angle involving damage control. We got Rampage, Collision, and yes, we have Vengeance Day coming up on Saturday, the NXT PLE. Talk about that. Last night, of course, was Dynamite, and they built up multiple matches for the February 7th show, which is doing quite well. And, of course, they've got a World Tag Team Championship match with Sting and Darby Allin, who have never been defeated as a team, going after the World Tag Team titles, and a number of others as well. So we'll talk about that, and also everything from uh, Dynamite last night. The top stories from Dynamite. And we've also got a bunch of news involving Vince McMahon, including a Netflix executive being asked about Vince. And, uh... Man, there was no uh, there was no mincing words there either. Much like Ronda Rousey did not mince words this weekend about Bruce Pritchard, who is undergoing triceps surgery. We'll tell you about that. Also got more on Janelle Grant and what her attorney is saying. Shawn Michaels did a media call for the NXT show and discussed a number of things and was asked about Vince McMahon. So we'll tell you about that, and we've also got an AW doubleheader coming up March 20th. It is going to be Dynamite, followed immediately by Rampage. So a lot to get into here today. We'll kick it up after the break. 425-780-7566 is the text message line. 425-780-7566. Back in a moment. Observer Live.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. A Netflix executive gave a blunt answer to a question regarding Vince McMahon on Wednesday. The company's content chief, Bella Bajaria, met with the press at a media event in Hollywood yesterday. When asked about McMahon, she only offered a brief response. He's gone! So he's not there, he's gone! Thanks, Bella! Also at yesterday's event, well, I mean, he ain't coming back. Netflix Brandon Rieg responded yeah, well. to questions <laughs> regarding the deal to bring WWE content to the streaming service, and then they talked about how great that was and everything like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You think Bella's going to say anything bad right now or try to say, well, I hope that WWE is taking the steps that it needs to take. I doubt she's checking out Janelle Grant's lawyer, do any media appearances, and wondering if there is some sort of issue that is taking place with the culture inside of that company and has taken place for quite some time. Hell, she probably hasn't even looked at what Bill Simmons has conjured up in this documentary, which had Vince McMahon's assistance involved with it and all of the things that led into this. I don't know. I just, I have a feeling that Bella just doesn't want to answer anything. And that stern answer she gave is basically going, oh no, he's gone. He's gone. Please don't ask me any more questions. He's gone, brother. He's gone. I got questions still. All right. Well, when he comes back, we can deal with it. But no, Janelle not... Grant's attorney. <laughs> I, I, I hope Janelle Grant's attorney can deal with it. Says her inbox has been flooded by those willing to attest to a culture of corruption. At WWE. On Thursday, lawyer Ann Callis appeared on Morning in America, spoke about the lawsuit her client filed last week against Vince. Said it's been a long process. She wants to speak out for any other victims, eradicate this culture of corruption that's permeated every cell of the WWE. I think that might be a little harsh. Grant's attorney continued yeah. to say she feels overwhelmed by the number of people who have come forward, including other possible victims. My office and my inbox have had a barrage of people wanting to come forward to attest about this culture of corruption and also possible victims, beginning now to wade through all of this, but we are frankly overwhelmed. Grant wants justice. She wants to change the culture that is going on in the WWE, wants to help other victims, thinks by speaking out and coming forward first, others will feel emboldened and encouraged to come forth. In the lawsuit, Grant contends WWE's internal probe into Vince that concluded in November 2022 was a sham. It states that no one from the company reached out to Grant regarding the investigation, despite her stating she was willing to take part. However, former member of WWE Board of Directors and head of the internal probe, Jeff Speed, told the New York Times the investigation, quote, included outreach to Ms. Grant and engagement with her lawyer. McMahon had Speed removed from the Board of Directors upon his return to the company as his executive chairman in early 2023. Vince McMahon, in his capacity as controlling shareholder of the company, has removed Joe Allen Lyons, Dylan, Jeffrey R. Speed, and Alan Wexler from the board, it said in January 6, 2023. That's when he strong-armed his way back in. And uh lawsuit filed against McMahon, Laurinaitis, and WWE. Feature story in the New Observer lo- newsletter. Dave wrote, for the third time since last June's revelation about women being paid hush money regarding sexual activity, including Vince McMahon, charges in a lawsuit filed on January 25th may finally end the career of the most powerful man in the history of the industry. I think it's ended. I would say it's ended. And as far as permeating every cell of WWE, listen, I mean, obviously, you know, there are a lot of people there that need to be gone. I think, uh, I think we can all agree on... Anyway, but uh, every single cell, I mean, there's a lot of good people in WWE that knew nothing. And I think that everybody should listen to uh, the Lance Storm show yesterday, who worked in WWE for a long, long time. And he's got a he's got a perspective about that. And uh, it actually uh, he's got some uh, memories of things that that happened to him that you know, he thought certain things and turned out that he was he was completely wrong when it comes to what someone might have done, what someone might have known. So it's a very good episode with Lance yesterday. And, uh, man, he struggled through that thing. That guy couldn't even breathe. And we got 40 minutes out of him. So, uh, 
And why was that for all of those who have not heard it quite yet? Well, he hasn't. Uh, he's getting an allergy test. Ooh, Had no. to go off all of his meds. Couldn't breathe. Couldn't sleep. Was just absolutely miserable. But he did a hell of a show yesterday. So head up and check it out at WrestlingObserver.com. And also, Bruce Pritchard is having tricep surgery. News was revealed on his Something to Wrestle with co-host podcast. Something to Wrestle with podcast <laughs> with co-host Conrad Thompson. They hope to record on Saturday. He had surgery in December as well. Rotator cuff surgery in 2022. And, of course, he's in the news because Ronda Rousey this weekend wrote, Bruce Pritchard is basically Vince's avatar. If he's still around, Vince still has a hand in the business. Vince was still running things through Bruce when he was gone before. She tweeted that before the Royal Rumble. That's when I knew she wasn't going to be in the Royal Rumble. (laughs) And she was not. She was not, no. No. Then we had the Shawn Michaels media call. So it said here he was asked about past allegations that Brutus Beefcake made about himself and Marty Jannetty. What were these allegations? Do you know? I do not know. Apparently, though, they've been walked back. Uh, Reading in the same article. Keep going here. I'll look them up. Says Michaels flatly denied them and said Beefcake himself walked those comments back in the past. He said he has made his mistakes in the past, never did anything that wasn't consensual, adding those who engage in that behavior typically have issues with power and women, which he never experienced. While never directly asked about his thoughts about the Vince McMahon lawsuit allegations from last week, Michaels was asked several times about the safety protocols environment at the Performance Center, reiterated they are they try to foster an open environment, welcome communication from talent, Asked if staff has had conversations with talents about the McMahon situation. He said everyone is aware. Takes working with young talent seriously in all aspects of the business. Wants him to tell the truth. Said everyone is excited about the future despite the situation. Said, quote, the windows have opened up. Everyone is ready to move forward. Well, I put Beefcake, Janetti, and Michaels into a Google search. And the first thing that comes up is the Squared Circle Reddit where there is a video of Brutus Beefcake on a kayfabe commentaries on one of the kayfabe commentaries series that Sean Oliver has done, all of which are usually very good, too. But apparently Beefcake laughs about how the rockers used to drug and rape women and then Mm. toss their unconscious naked bodies out in their hotel halls, which apparently Michael said, as you mentioned, uh, Beefcake has walked that back. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to defend Shawn Michaels here. I don't know what any of these people have done in their past or anything like that. But I do know when it comes to men like Brutus Beefcake and Marty Jannetty, they seem to have a penchant for just saying anything that comes into their head in the moment. So, yeah, that's all I know about this. And I don't think we're. Yeah, Marty had that issue where he was now. Remember, he was telling that story in a podcast and then like. He, he killed a man to watch him story, die or something. Story about yeah. killing him or whatever. And yeah. then, like, the police heard it and they actually started investigating. <laughs> and then Marty was like, I totally made that one up. And I don't even know what came of that. But, like, they went looking around after he said that on the podcast. So, I don't know. <laughs> Idiots. I do not Dumb know. Dumb people. Well, you know, it's... it's, it's uh, Broken people, more than anything. There certainly was a, a culture in wrestling... Oh, yeah. But there were also a whole bunch of total liars. Yeah. And so trying to uh, trying to piece things together from who said what about who, it's not always easy. I That's because... why I'm, you know, I hope the culture is changing completely because there was a culture of GHB and date rape drugs being used, not just in wrestling, but apparently in a lot of places in the 90s with club drugs and things like that. And it's just... It's sick, and there are a lot of horrible people involved in pro wrestling. But as Lance Storm proves, every time he shows up somewhere, you know, there are also a lot of really great people involved in wrestling. And again, there's always going to be bad people associated with things, no matter in what line of work and that you're in or anything like that. But a lot of these people, hopefully they're being pushed out for good, and that culture is changing once and for all. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
for you, what were some of the interviews that were your absolute favorite? You're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm interviewing this person. <laughs> Any favorite like moments that you had? Cause you got some really fun moments with the talent yes. uh, when you're a backstage interviewer. Well, dating back, I'm sure you saw it on digital, on social, talking about the way. Do you remember Austin Theory and yeah. Hurtwell, Johnny Gargano, Candace Gargano, Candace LeRae? Like it, the stuff that we would do for social media interviews for YouTube, that was like, it, it was almost a challenge to see who could laugh, make each other laugh first because we would start the whole thing normal. And I wouldn't even ask John, I wouldn't even tell Johnny, hey, I'm going to ask you this question. We would just start it and then he would go off on a tangent. And then I would go back with something that he didn't expect me to say. And we just had this dynamic relationship on camera with all of the way, which was so fun. Um, and then you look at like Javier Bernal, when I was doing the little back and forth thing with him. And that was a lot of ad lib. I think that a lot of people get the misconception that it's all scripted. I mean, to an extent, you know what you're going to ask, you know what your question is, you know what you need to get out of the interview. But I think how you give a nonverbal or how you respond in a moment whenever maybe so something somebody says something that you weren't expecting, like how you respond to that is really what grabs the audience's attention because they feel the this authenticity behind it. They feel the genuinity of like, oh, okay, I can feel the emotion behind this interview. So I love doing this stuff with Javier because I think it was my first time that people were like, oh, Mackenzie has a personality. <laughs> Mackenzie, like, oh, I, this is who she is. Got it. Cool. Okay. You do have a little wit behind you. And then Grayson Waller, like the dynamic that we had between our interviews or when we were talking on camera was just, it was natural because how he would respond is how I would respond. And we just had that natural banter. What was it like working with Shawn Michaels? He's awesome. He's awesome. I don't know if you got the opportunity to meet him. I did actually. NXT. He's so nice. <laughs> yeah. And he's, and he's like, not in, I mean, he's intimidating, of course, because he's Shawn Michaels, but he's just a lovable guy. Like he's just there to listen and to help, to help you and to help the company. And, um, he, my husband, like he is Shawn's biggest fan. If you say, who's your two biggest wrestling fans? Like, and I always joke with Shawn. I'm like, if somebody said, okay, to Vic, you have to choose your wife or you have to choose Shawn Michaels. I'd be gone. I'd be out. It would, it, I, I don't know. I don't hold a candle to you. And then you'd be like, no. You, so we always had a running joke about that. Um, but Sean's great. It was, it meant so much to see such the kind words that he had to say about me in the press conference. Um, I loved working with him. I am endlessly thankful for him and the experiences I had with him at NXT. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Other notes from the NXT call. He was asked about Jordan Grace as being Shawn Michaels. Says it's a different era now. Things that weren't allowed in the past are now possible. He said that Paul Levesque gets to do these things on the main roster. And he's questioned why it hasn't happened at NXT yet. He would love the opportunity to bring experienced talent in from outside groups to work with NXT wrestlers. Well, he actually gets most of them first. Gonna get Julia here in a while. God, I would love that actually. I would love it because a guy like, look, there's only, and I'm not. People have their opinions about Moose. I'm just looking at this from a pure wrestling point of view. Moose needs to be as far away from Impact as possible for as long as possible, and then come back because what else could that man do there? There are guys that, like a Steve Macklin, there's only so many people he can face. There's somebody that you're trying to improve upon him going over, wrestling some other people, not the worst idea. And having some people with experience on NXT so we don't see some of these other people with, like, no experience whatsoever, which... Again, I know it's developmental, but they have NXT house shows, probably not enough of them since they only seem to be 
Fridays and Saturdays every two weeks or something like that. But like the more that a lot of these people who need experience in different aspects, whether it's being on TV or just in the ring or whatever it is, the more they can kind of intermingle. It's not the worst thing in the world. It really isn't. Also talked about William Regal, said we probably see him again. And talked about how they don't have to work hard to find spots for women on NXT because there are so many talented athletes that bring it week after week. This probably was in regards to uh, women being used. Heavily credited Sarah Motto for the work she's done. Said she's the best kept secret in the business. Maybe this was not the best week to be putting over the women's action in uh, NXT. Well, I'll, I'll say this. They do a great job with the women, showcasing the women. Like, if you watch NXT, I mean, what they want is for you to see the women as, as big a stars as the men. The issue is that they don't work as well. And they have a lot of very, very green women on television. And they don't really have great matches. But, you know, there have been many that I've seen improvement in. I mean, Lash Legend is vastly improved yeah. from where Fal- when she started. Fallon Henley. As Fallon, a complete, yeah. Yeah, like a complete product. Look, the, one, one of the biggest concerns that they should have is the fact that, and we haven't seen her in a while, but Tiffany Stratton has leveled. She completely, hit, she was on the rise, everything. The look is, all of the aesthetic is there, and then she just... Pfft, and she is flatlined completely to the point now where it's like, I wonder if Fallon Henley long term is a more valuable prospect than a Tiffany Stratton is going to be. It's just, again, they have an embarrassment of riches as far as pure athletes go. But again, there's women like Ariana Grande and plenty of other ones that like, or what's her name? I forget. Santino's daughter, like a great gimmick. I mean, she's comfortable doing that. But as far as in the ring, I mean, she's, well, she's pretty terrible. We got uh, Wednesday, March 20th, AEW, according to Andrew Zarian. It's going to be a three-hour block. It will be two hours of dynamite, followed by a live rampage. And that is due to March Madness. First round of the men's college basketball tournament will be airing in Rampage's regular time slot, March 22nd. Just cancel the show for that week. Don't mm. do this to people. Don't Actually, do you want to know, you wanna know why? There. I don't want to bring this up because it's going to make everybody mad. Go ahead. You want to know why? Why? Rankings. <laughs> Stop it. No, I'm trying to tell you guys. Like, they don't have dark and elevation anymore. And so to make these rankings work, people need to have matches. And so, no, you can't just cancel a Rampage or whatever. Like... They, Why aren't they utilizing ROH guys as part of these rankings now anyway? Hey. You know what's funny is <laughs> you know what's funny is we talked about rankings, rankings on the uh on the Observer show last night. I wake up this morning and the thread's like, God only knows how many pages long. And people are like outraged by the rankings discussion. And they're like <laughs> mad at, at Dave and I for our and it's like, okay, listen, we argued about what the, the rules were of the rankings. But, like, we both agree we don't like the rankings. Like, we weren't fighting about the rankings. And then but and then the guy goes, I was really angry last night because, you know, there were a lot of mistakes made. Some were corrected and some were not. And I was like, okay, what, 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 do, we, what do we mistake? What wasn't corrected? Because when I read the, the thread, it was like nobody had any idea for sure what the <laughs> rankings exactly were. It's like... Did we start them over in January? What about... It's like, hey, listen, if we go 15 minutes trying to figure this out and then the board has four pages and they're trying to figure it out and then people are getting mad, maybe we didn't need these rankings brought back. Do you think as a, maybe for the listener, though, it was the fact that, like, this is 40 minutes into that show and and it's you, you spend a good deal of time on it? Maybe maybe that was it as opposed to the fact that no, there was I'll tell you what it was. I'll tell you what it was. <laughs> and I think you should all listen to it actually for comedy purposes, because it begins. It begins with Dave and I essentially agreeing that we don't like the rankings. And then I think she just can't, can't help himself. It's like Dave starts arguing for 15 minutes about how the rankings could work or whatever. And then after 15 minutes, he goes, I don't even want to talk about him again. I don't like him. I was like, what? (laughs) We could have had this over within one minute. What do we go 15 minutes for? And for everybody out there listening right now who has not heard that show yet, here's a little trigger warning for you. 
they do talk about it again in the Dynamite review, just for a very short period of time, but it happens. Well, I mean, hey, listen, if you think we can't talk about rankings, that's impossible because it's going to be a pivotal part of these storylines. Like, that's literally yeah. what we got to, where, where you know, in the rankings, in the rankings, Swerve is number one and Hangman is number two. And then on the show, Hangman said, we're actually tied. And so we're going to do, there's going to be a match next week to determine who gets Samoa Joe. Even though right here it says Swerve is actually the number one contender. So you, you cannot discuss Dynamite without discussing the rankings because they're tied into the show. That's Where is it. Orange Cassidy on the list? He's not on the list. He's a champion. Oh. So he's unranked. Sure. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, you think he would be ranked for like the world title, but he's not. I would think so. I mean, in the old PWI ones, I mean, the, your number one contender was usually like, you know, not these US rankings. champion, the Intercontinental champion, but no, that's not, not how it is. No. And we do have to at least mention in the rankings that uh, the number two contenders for the tag titles behind Sting and Darby are John Silver and Alex Reynolds. <laughs> well, I have not seen win a match on Dynamite or Collision in God only knows how long. And Dave said, well, they've been winning a lot on Ring of Honor. They're not even doing it alphabetically for them to be there. How the hell did that happen? So apparently Ring of Honor wins count for the AW tag team. Well, if that's the case, shouldn't Athena be the number one contender for everything? Where was FTR? FTR are in the six-man rankings, but not the tag rankings. <laughs> They're not good enough as a tag team. Only a six-person with Daniel Garcia. <laughs> yes. Oh, my. <laughs> and everybody does know and maybe they don't like when it comes to like boxing rankings and things like that like they were only done to justify a title shot and to get like you know sanctioning money by the sanctioning bodies like that's it you know other than that it's just a, a ranking of okay who's the best or whatever like companies shouldn't be doing who's the best the only reason they should have these ratings i guess is because if you're in the top 10, you can get a world title shot. Other than that, I just always have thought rankings and keeping records in pro wrestling is dumb. I've never seen it work. And I've seen top 10s in pro wrestling for years try to be uh, applied, and they never work. I've never seen them work. So, again, they're trying to do something here from the past, which has failed multiple times and trying to put a new shine on it. And it's already failed for them once. I don't know why they're going back to this. Hey, do you again, know why I hate the internet, by the way? <laughs> it could be a lot what, of reasons. One reason here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone, someone brought up here that punk needs to tell Tony again to get rid of the ratings. So if you actually listen to the show where I discuss this, <laughs> I put over CM Punk. The whole point of this segment was that punk was right. We're on the same page. That was a great call. Thank you, Phil. Okay? Thank you, Phil. Well, a bunch of idiots on the internet, like, I don't know if they splice it up or they cut it a bunch of stuff, <laughs> but now on the internet all over, it's, I have blamed CM Punk <laughs> for there no longer being rankings. And then, like, I saw a bunch of memes, Brian Alvarez blaming CM Punk for, like, the sinking of the Titanic. Like, somehow this became, like, it was a, I considered it a negative that he got rid of the rankings. It, that is, you couldn't do a bigger 180 than what I was actually saying, which was, thank you, Phil. Thank you for talking him out of the rankings. Somebody that spun in a, another thing that I'm mad at Phil about. The exact opposite. The exact Angry. opposite. NXT, 648,000. Point one eight in 18 to 49. Falling like a rock. It's not falling like a rock. It's still up 10.4% in total viewers and almost 40% in 18 to 49 year over year. <laughs> so there you go. And you know what, what? Whatever happens this year still doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what they do at this point for CW. You know, the other thing, we were talking about the collision ratings yesterday. And uh, one thing no one's talking about is the collision viewership was actually not that bad, all things considered. But the collision demo was terrible. And the reason for that is exactly what we've been talking about with WWE. Their 18 to 34 and 18 to 49 numbers are up. And so that's the people that didn't watch collision, the young viewers. They were the ones that chose WWE over AW collision. So that's a big shift over the last couple of years. 
You know, the, the old days of only old people watch WWE. Where are these new fans going to come from? These new fans are here now. They're watching. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Hello. He's escaped. Do you know which way he was headed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shoulders. He's been here. It's a mini straight jacket. I'm getting close. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper BB, also WrestlingObserver.com. This person here says, was anyone clamoring for the rankings to come back? Man, I better not find out it was Twitter. It better not be because of this whole gender thing. Oh, God. That'll upset me. Because I know people were complaining. They were, at first it was like, how come gender is getting a shot? Then the people were doing the, yeah, but an AEW, you know? What's her face got a shot? And then it was like, uh This is all stupid. Let's talk about the show. I'll do the full review later on tonight with Vinny. But a few notes. They did the two the two uh, dealer's choice matches. And uh, thumbs up and thumbs in the middle. I would thumbs not say thumbs middle. down. Thumbs in the middle for both. Well, no, not the matches themselves. Because I, I believe... <laughs> Here's the problem with these two matches, okay? The idea was like they, you know, Hangman and Swerve are each going to choose an opponent for the other to like put them through the ring or whatever. So both of these opponents, Toliona looked freaking great. Yeah, he did. And God, let me tell you, for being 53 years old with a lot of miles on his body, yeah, very haggard. My man. God, did Rob Van Dam do a good job in that match? But like, the thing was, Swerve and Hangman gave them so much. 
They sold and sold and sold and sold and sold. And like the idea I thought was supposed to get Hangman and Swerve over is like, you know, these are the top two guys in the entire company. We got to find out who the best guy is in order to face Samoa Joe. And it's like in storyline, both of them barely made it past these opponents. Hangman couldn't even hit this guy with the buckshot. He had to pin him with a, a, a flash cradle after Toa avoided the uh, buckshot and laid him out with a Samoan drop. So this is a, a, there's a lot of this in AEW where, you know, storyline-wise, I absolutely would not have booked these matches this way. But, like, in a vacuum, if you just want to watch great matches, Hangman and Toa was great. And, and Swerve and Rob Van Dam, I mean... I always watch these swerve matches, and I'm always thinking, all right, this is the one where the swerve match ain't going to be that good. But every time. I don't know how the guy does it, besides being great. He's pretty damn good. But yeah, he had I mean, a it's... great match with uh, with Rob Van Dam, all things considered. And uh, they announced next week. Like, next week is a pay-per-view caliber show. They've got the Sting and Darby match for the tag team titles. Sting and Darby have never lost as a team, and Sting's never done a job at all. They're going up against Ricky Starks and Big Bill. And then we've also got the, I mean, this is a pay-per-view match, Swerve and Hangman 3, and the winner gets Samoa Joe. And Swerve has beaten him twice. So, I mean, there's only two options, I think. One of them is Hangman wins, and you do one-on-one Hangman Joe. The other is you do a screwy finish to set up a three-way, which is what I think they're going to do for the Revolution show. And then we've got Jericho and Takeshita and John Moxley and Brian Danielson and Claudio versus Mystico, Volador, and Hechicero. Not bad. Not bad at all. They also have a Tony Khan big announcement. <laughs> Not major. Oh, it's a big announcement. Okay. I believe they're going to be announcing the date of Boston. Boston? And I think that that is going to be the show that Mercedes debuts on. Money. Yeah. So that Mm. will be... And I think they'll do it probably... I don't know if they'll flat out announce she'll be there. I think they're going to do the CM Punk thing Yeah, where they just make it patently obvious and try and build it up as a massive show. Mm -hmm. But I believe that's next week's announcement. But I don't know. I mean, hey, they could... They could do uh, Okada if he ends up going there. Well... But Okada... Hey, listen. Okada is... is, uh, He's negotiating with both sides. So... A lot of people are way overconfident one way or the other, and I don't think that you should be. I would say it's probably 50-50, and I, I say that because I know people in both companies that think that's where he's going. It is not, you know, sometimes, you know, for example, the Julia story, not 50-50. I mean, you talk to people in AEW, and they're like, I think she's going to WWE. Talk to people in WWE, they, I think she's coming here. So <laughs> it's not like 50-50. But with Okada, it is. And both sides have money. And both sides want him. So we shall see what happens. And also with that, uh, I was thinking about this Big Bill and Ricky versus Sting and Darby. It seems obvious, one would say, that uh, Sting and Darby win the tag team titles. What? What do you mean, what? I guess you could. I guess so. I don't like it. You're gonna Here's beat. What, you're gonna beat Sting going into his final match. Mm, no, but you. Can well, then the he has to win the tag titles. No, he doesn't. You can have the Young Bucks come out there and screw things up. And look, the only reason I would for a want... DQ. Yeah, they're not gonna do a DQ. Well, I, I guess if you're doing a screwy finish with Swerve and Page, then you definitely don't want to do two of those on the same show. Not to say that they wouldn't, because they have. But you know, the only reason that I would want to see Sting and Darby win the belts is because you can have Sting lose in his last match in Greensboro and again, have FTR go and chase the Young Bucks off and let Sting get a chance to celebrate and then set up Nicholas and Matthew or whatever their names are against FTR and then you have a title feud that way. You have the title feud that I think maybe a lot of people have wanted, which are heel Young Bucks and the FTR that combination there. I mean, that's the only reason I would like to see that happen because otherwise you know, the thing with Ricky Starks is at some point, like 
you know, how many times are you going to beat this guy? How many times you kind of get him, get him up to a level and fall? Like, I like Starks and Bill. And we're talking about the fact they have no tag teams. I mean, they take their eye off the ball when it comes to tag teams. They they failed incredibly with that. And you're talking about a company that had a zillion tag teams at the beginning. So I, I'm not sure I love that idea. Again, well, listen. You can have, you can have them lose. If Darby takes the fall, you don't have to beat Sting. They've never been beaten as a team. This is a big thing. But I'm going to tell you what I think is going to so happen. They're, so he, he, they're going to beat the Bucks too, and retire with the tag team? Well, here's the thing. Here's right. the thing. There's there's two options. Option one is they win the tag titles. There's many options, actually. <laughs> Option one is they win the tag titles. They go to Sting's final match. They beat the Young Bucks. Sting retires as champion. It is a happy ending for everybody in Greensboro, okay? Yeah. The other option is that Sting and Darby win the tag titles. They go to Greensboro, and the Young Bucks win the titles in Sting's final match. He puts them over, okay? Now, if you think about that, why do the Young Bucks need that win over Sting and Darby? They don't. If I'm Sting... And I've decided I will put someone over before I leave. Well, the answer is, next week, Ricky Starks pins Sting. Now, here's the thing. Mm. That ain't going to happen clean, okay? They did two things last night. They had a segment with Sting and Darby and Ricky and Big Bill. And they said, Ricky, what's your problem? And Ricky said, in your first match in Sting you beat me and it has been bothering me for four years okay so what better way to wrap up this story than before he goes out Sting does his one job and he puts over Ricky Starks on the way out now they also did a segment where the Young Bucks were talking to Darby and they were like we've been back a month You're ignoring us. You haven't texted us. You haven't done anything. And Darby says, I am fully concentrated on winning the world tag team titles. And he walked off. And Matthew said, we're going to need to get through to him in another way. Mm -hmm. So here's the only problem with this scenario. The Young Bucks could screw Sting and Darby allowing Ricky Starks to pin Sting and win the match, okay? The only problem is you will have to find a way to explain why Matthew and Nicholas cost Sting and Darby the tag team titles when they are getting a match with them in Sting's final match. They didn't want the tag team titles. So if they can find a way to plug that hole... I can see Sting deciding, I got, I'm going to do one job before I go. I will not go undefeated. I want to put one person over. And in, when you think about it, the Young Bucks don't need to be put over. If you're going to put one guy over or one team over, it's Big Bill and Ricky Starks. Yeah, and it should be Ricky Starks. And I like that idea. I think the one thing you can do is, as EVPs with their new character, we can give ourselves a title match anytime we want, right? I mean, if you wanted to, again, it would be might be a cheap way to get out of it, but you could do that because they're the EVPs and they have this new smarmy character that they're doing. Where the yeah, look, we can just we can find people anytime we want indiscriminately for any reason and make you pay it by the end of the day. I think those guys could give themselves a title shot whenever they so chose, if that would even come up. Because again. That may be overthinking how people respond to it. They may just respond so angry that Sting lost and Starks got the victory that if you're a fan watching, that's not going to be, you know, your main thing is not going to be, well, the Young Bucks just screwed themselves out of a tag title shot. Like, I don't know if that's going to be, if that's going to get through. Well, they wouldn't They wouldn't say it that way. They need a, they need a, a promo, which honestly, it wouldn't be that hard. I mean, you can have well, the Bucks say, any, "Listen." Anything over the next couple of days to lead into that. You can have the Bucks say, "We have been tag team champions all over the world. We are the greatest tag team of all time. We want nothing more than to win those tag team titles. Except, it is more important to destroy Sting and Darby and retire them. That's it. Yeah. 
And look, if you wanted to go in the direction where if you want the complete if you want the complete happy ending, it may cost you more. But if you want the complete happy ending for Sting and Greensboro, where if they do defeat Starks and Bill and win the belts, and then they go on and defeat the Young Bucks in Greensboro, well, then you have a new, you have a reason for the ratings all of a sudden. You have a reason for the ratings because Sting retires, and that's your thing leading into, I don't know, Forbidden Door or whatever the next pay-per-view would be. We're going to have the tag title tournament. It would fill some time. It would give you a reason for the ratings. It would give the Young Bucks a, a, a chance. You mean to, the rankings? The rankings. It would give the Young Bucks a, a possibility or a chance to, again, be smarmy to the rest of the division as well, too, in-ring heels as well as being administrative heels. So there's a lot of different ways that, that this could actually work. Here's also the uh, the other problem. With Sting and Darby winning. Yes. What happens with Ric Flair? The frickin' rankings. Oh. <laughs> the Young Bucks are unranked. Yeah. <laughs> they are unranked. And so if Sting and Darby win the tag team titles... Non-title match. Then Sting's final match should be John Silver and Alex Reynolds. <laughs> the EVPs cannot allow themselves to be put in this type of match. We're calling it a non-title match. I mean, literally, if you if you start <laughs> these rankings, and in the literally the very first month... The Bucks just go. I know we're unranked, but we're going to give ourselves a, a championship match because we're uh, we're EVPs. Yeah. Well, I think I think Sting <laughs> is losing to uh, Starks. That's my prediction. I like that, and because again, Starks and Bill deserve some time to hold on to those belts, and it gives Starks. Again, I'd like to see more with him individually as things go along too, but we'll see how it all plays out for him. By the way, uh, Wardlow. Suffered a knee injury against Commander. He tweeted that he was fine. His knee was fine. But uh, his knee was not fine. They looked it over. They believed it was a torn meniscus. They believed it was it was not serious. But he is having it looked at today. And uh, when we know more, we'll let you know. Back in a moment, Observer Live. When you think of your time four years on NXT, you were able to show people who you were, what kind of interviewer you were, and all of that. But the goal is eventually to get to Raw and SmackDown. Did you ever have any conversation surrounding that? Well, I think everybody wants to get to Raw and SmackDown, right? Like, I think that's kind of the goal in all of professional wrestling. I don't know if everyone feels the way feels that same way, but I think majority of people would want to get to Raw and SmackDown and be on the road and have those WWE moments. Um, I, of course, wanted that. I, of course, wanted at some point to get to Raw and SmackDown, but I also felt like NXT kind of became my home and people really loved me on NXT. Um, from everyone in the company it just they they just kept saying like i remember andy hartwell said something to me one time she's like when you think about nxt you're the best fit of an interviewer that i've ever seen for nxt and i don't know why i don't know why that is exactly or if people can put a finger on what that is exactly about me and nxt that made sense but it just made sense and then once my husband started doing commentary for nxt then it was like we were kind of this kind of this package deal with nxt too so I was able to tap into that and really create my own <clears throat> story within, NX, in, within NXT in my own home, which I loved. Um, but it's hard to say that I wouldn't have ever wanted to go to Raw and SmackDown. I think part of the reason why you fit in with NXT was, well, your interview style, but also the fact that because you had been there, you knew everybody. And so it didn't feel like, oh, just new girl coming in and let's just rehearse these lines. Instead, sure. it felt because you were there, you knew the people already, you knew their stories, you knew what was happening. And I think that familiarity is mm -hmm. what really helped you, uh, you know, shine on, on NXT. And it was unique that I got to learn and work with new talent. You think about from the black and gold to NXT 2.0, that was really, um, nobody can, I don't know if many people can say that they went from black and gold into the NXT 2.0 into where we are now. And it was fun getting to work with new talent and new superstars such as Braun Breaker and Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams and Roxanne Perez even, and them on the rise, because I was able to work with the likes of 
Johnny and Candace and Tommaso and Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly Undisputed Era and then Raquel and then you go to a whole new era of what was 2.0 to where it was an adjustment but it was also really cool um and fun you have to evolve and so it was able I was able to evolve with all these talent and now I get to see them go off and succeed and see what Carmelo is doing on Smackdown right now and Dragon Lee and like all these it's, it's really exciting because I was able to connect with all of these talent throughout their journey and be a crucial part of their journey I felt Okay. Yeah. So it's brought to my attention during the break that on Rampage on Friday, they're doing a title eliminator. <laughs> it's Ricky and Big Bill versus the Dark Order. Why? Where if the Dark Order win, they get a title shot, okay? But we have rankings now. They are ranked number two... Behind Sting and Darby, who are getting a title match Wednesday. So why do we need a title eliminator? After Wednesday, they will be they will be deserving of a championship match. They will be the new number one contenders. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Like the point of the title eliminator or the what was the other one they used to call? Proving ground match? Proving ground. Okay, they had those back when there were no rankings. Okay, well, we want to give, uh, you know, Mystico and Volador a tag title match. Well, we'll do a Proving Grounds match. If they win, then they get a title shot. Okay, well, that's all fine. We don't have rankings. Well, now we do have rankings. So why do we have rankings, but we still have title eliminators? And what? Especially because the people in the title eliminator match are currently ranked number two. It's not like you're doing a title eliminator with Filthy Tom and... Me? We're unranked. Last I he's checked. Got, he's got a new partner now. He doesn't need you Who? anymore. Fred Rosser. Is this official? Hey. It was teased. Oh, look. Yeah, you're going to we'll see, see the swerve. Happens. You're going to see the swerve when it's it, when it's me and Fred Rosser against them bang bros. Oh, my God. What? We take you those titles home. Yeah, me and Fred. We're like this. You ever heard us on the show? Come on. We're out of time. I'll be back later on tonight with Vinny. We'll do the entire Dynamite Report, AW Dynamite and NXT. Going to be a fun time. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.